Hello, and welcome to the SFCA podcast. Our goal is to inspire travel. We want to expose you to what Miami and South Florida has to offer. From Key Biscayne to Coconut Grove, South Beach to Calle Ocho and everywhere in between. Miami is a vibrant city and offers a wide array of popular attractions and venues. Come join us. Welcome, everyone. Finally, some cool weather. Congrats to our friends and partners at Travel Host. They have released their latest issue under new management and ownership. We will have the details in the post show notes on how you can get your magazines if you have not gotten them. Make sure your hotel is receiving copies. If not, you can speak with Yvonne Rohrbacher for more information. Again, her information will be on the show notes. October's Cancer Awareness Month. The month is almost over, but let's not forget those that continue to fight the terrible illness. Hence is why I'm wearing pink. Our thoughts and prayers and are, are go out to the civilians that have endured and continue to suffer through the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Thank you for joining us. We truly appreciate your continued support. This on our 41st Zoom call. And Andrew, you've, I think, got the record of most of the calls, most of the participation on all the calls. So thank you very much, Andrew, for your continued support. A special recognition to our sales teams, hotel managers, and support staff that are on the call. For those of you just joining us for the first time, welcome on the call as we share facts, figures, and stats on South Florida tourism. We also have some entertaining, informative facts that we hope you will enjoy. I want to ensure that everyone's familiar with the chat feature. You're welcome to ask questions of the panel via the chat or the Q&A. When we do the contest, please respond via the chat feature only, not the Q&A, because that's what we are monitoring, that is the chat feature. Today, we got some amazing prizes. Annie's going to be giving away two tickets to the Friends Experience. Uh, Shari's going to be giving away two tickets to the, uh, the the movies at Lincoln Road Rooftop. If you've never experienced that, which most of us have not, it is an experience in itself. And then Andrew will be giving away what we all need most, $50 gas card. It seems like prices are starting to dip a little. Hopefully, it'll continue to dip. All you have to do is focus on the presentations, listen to the question, be the first to give the right answer via the chat, and win. You can win only once on the call. If you win, you will be disqualified from the next question. We want everyone to have a, a fair share in the prizes. So good luck to everyone. On the call today, we have Andrew Wovensmith with the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau giving us all the latest stats and facts of South Florida tourism. Regrettably, actually regrettably for us, but good for her. Ceci Velasco is not on the call today. She's usually a, a normal panelist as well, but she just got married on Saturday. So congratulations to, to, to Ceci and her new husband. We wish you all the best and enjoy the remainder or beginning of your honeymoon. And we will hopefully see you next month. Special guest on this call this month, we have Annie Dempsey, Manager of Brand Marketing for the Friends Experience, and Shari Lucas, Head of Sales and Sponsorships for Rooftop Cinema Club, South Beach. So without further ado, if you're a Friends fanatic, we've got Annie to say give you all the latest news and updates on Friends. Go ahead, Annie. It's all yours, and you can start your presentation whenever you'd like. Well, thank you for that intro. Hi, everyone. I, like Miguel said, I'm Annie Dempsey. I'm the marketing manager for the Friends Experience. Um, we are so excited to be coming to the Miami area this week, actually. So I'm just going to share a couple um, slides about what the Friends Experience is, um, what we're doing in Miami, how long we're going to be here. Um, and like Miguel said, give away a couple pairs of tickets. So this should be very, very fun. If you are a Friends fan, you will enjoy this. Share my screen. All right. Awesome. So I um, I actually work for Original X Productions. Um, we produce the Friends Experience in partnership with Warner Brothers. Uh, the Friends Experience started as a pop-up in 2019 in New York City, uh, actually for the 25th anniversary of the show. So um, we, it was incredibly successful. It sold out. So we said, we have to make this a permanent thing. This week, clearly a demand for it. Um, so now we have a permanent flagship in New York City, as well as two sets that travel to different uh, cities in North America. Um, we've also expanded into Europe. Um, we have a Europe, a UK, and even an Australian touring set now. So we are expanding globally. Um, which is just a huge testament to the fandom of friends uh, around the world. 
these are a couple pictures of the experience. So at the experience, um, you'll be able to see original costumes, props from the show. Um, there are plenty of photo ops of some of your favorite moments from the show. You see Central Perk here. We've got the famous pivot scene with Ross in the hallway. Um, we've got Monica's apartment, Chandler and Joey's apartment. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I'm going to play this short video, and I'm not sure if the audio is going to play. I don't think so, but I'll let yeah. it play. So, yeah, the world's most beloved franchise, billions of minutes watch. Um, Friends has over 200. Actually, ooh, I'm not going to say because I think that's a trivia question later. But, um, you know, lots of content from Friends um, and lots of moments that are iconic um and it's hard to pick which ones go into this experience honestly because there's so many memories so many nostalgia packed scenes here so we've tried to pick some of uh some fan favorites <laughs> you see costumes here iconic photo ops we do have exclusive merchandise to the friends experience store Awesome. All right. First trivia question. Oh my God. All right. Be the first to answer this trivia question about friends and you will win a free pair of tickets to the one in Miami. So how many seasons of friends were there? Oh, 10. Daniel, immediately. <laughs> ten. Daniel, congratulations, Daniel. You are a winner. So we will connect you with Annie and get you the information to uh, to enjoy a show at your of your choosing. Correct, Annie? Yep. Yep. Any date? So you have six months. You're here till April. No. Yeah, we're here till the, the end of March. End of March. So starting Friday until the end of March, you'll have a show mm -hmm. of your choice and enjoy, Danny. Congrats and thank you for everyone for responding. Thank you, Annie. If anyone has any questions for Annie, you're more than welcome to go ahead and still ask the questions throughout the. Uh, yeah. Throughout the presentation, I'll be more than happy to connect you with her or answer or share that question so she can in turn uh, share it with everyone, you know, respond to you and everyone on the call. Thank you, Andy. Let me unpin you here from the call. One second. Oops. There we go. Yeah, so we will be here through March 24th um, and we open on Friday. So Yes, um, come see us while we're here. We're at Aventura Mall, um, right inside Treats Food Hall. Um, you can't miss us. <laughs> um, and we have a friends and family preview night, which I think Mike Miguel sent the uh, info out for. So if you would like to get a sneak peek on Thursday night um, at Aventura Mall, come out and see us. There we go. And we're going to be sharing it once again in the show notes as well. Just click the link, RSVP. It is a popular, popular, popular show. So if you're interested, how many can attend at a time per, per click? Is um, so, per person or you have a, up to how many guests? Um, so you can, members here can reserve up to 10 tickets each for our friends and family preview. Cool. Um, and then if you'd like to purchase tickets for another day, it is a timed entry ticket. Um, but you are welcome to spend as much time as you want in the experience once you're there. Um, I'm just looking at the comments real quick. So it is at Aventura Mall, again, at Treats Food Hall. Um, the cost, so tickets start at $27.50. Um, we do offer student and military discounts. And I see Jody mentioned that she clicked it and it says sold out. So I don't know if you want to check that. Yeah, we'll check that for you guys and send it back out. Um, and then tour options. So you can um, you can reach out to me if you're interested in scheduling a private tour, um, but the experience is self-guided. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. And next on deck, we have Shari with All Things Theater. And this is a good thing. You remember at the beginning of COVID, people said that theater were, were a thing of the past, especially in closed theaters. So for those that still have that stigma that they're in an enclosed space, this is a totally different experience outside in the elements. The weather is amazing. Hopefully it'll stay that way with minimal rain. And you'll get to see a great, great show. Shari, go ahead and load up your presentation whenever you have a moment. Awesome. 
just going to share my screen. Good morning, everyone. All right. Hopefully you guys can see my screen there. Are we all good, Perfectly. Miguel? Perfect. Perfect. Well, like Miguel said, uh, being in an enclosed theater is a thing of the past. And Rooftop Cinema Club wants to re-envision the way you see films. And we created an amazing concept called Rooftop Cinema Club. So imagine you're on a beautiful rooftop. First, you're going to see our amazing and stunning views. So at all of our locations, we have selected venues that is going to give you the best open air experience with the views. Um, our spaces are created to be very Instagrammable, very pop-up moments. So it's going to be bright, bold colors on site, a lot of photo moments. We also include the, you Know, concession stands, the bar, and of course, cinema. So we started off by specializing in cult classic cinema, but uh, across our nine venues now across the U.S., two in the U.K., with three more venues coming in 2024 in the U.S., we show a combination of cult classic films as well as some new releases. So I'm going to just go through a few slides here so that you guys can see what Rooftop is all about. So like I said, we are the ultimate outdoor experience. Uh, we have been known as the, you know, the like the Soho house of theaters. Uh, we are an open air experience. Um, it's the perfect setting for a date night, a friend's night, um, a night out with your co-workers to see some really great films. We are also a cinema with style. So we have bold pop-up moments on site, awesome cocktails, uh, themed experiences. And of course, you can't forget the yummy popcorn. And it's more than just a movie. So we have curated a collection of cult classic films that span between Pulp Fiction, Love and Basketball, Pretty Woman, which is my favorite. But I also have to mention Top Gun, which is our CEO Jerry's favorite, favorite, favorite film. So with planning, we have a, pro a program that is planning made super easy. You're going to select your venue, you're going to select your time, and you're going to select your film. And that is it. That is how you plan an event at Rooftop Cinema Club. We do everything from movie premieres to uh, television show uh, premieres, also holiday events, company events, and we throw some amazing birthdays. So imagine, you know, you're born in 19-something. I'm not going to date myself, but I want to show the film that was released you know, on the, you know, the year that I was born, or you want to do a fun theme with your girlfriends and everyone dresses up like Barbie and Ken, and we're going to show Barbie. So there's so many fun concepts that you can create around film. The themes are super endless. I'm going to bypass this slide because it's just going to talk about, you know, your experience. But I like to note that it is silent disco style. So while you're on the rooftop, we have the noise canceling headsets. So you're not going to hear the planes flying over you, the birds chirping over you or someone smacking on their popcorn. You're going to have the headsets on that's going to cancel out all of those noises. And again, we do brand activations, TV premieres, amazing bar and bat mitzvahs, uh, special events, fashion shows, you name it. We've worked with a lot of the top brands as well as the streaming platforms for the releases of their new films. And here's a highlight of our location. So we got downtown LA, San Diego, El Segundo, Chicago, Fort Worth, Houston, Miami, which is my favorite. <laughs> I just absolutely love the views in Miami and it is a beautiful, beautiful space. And again, these are just some of the, a little bit of inspiration for you. So we do dress up cinema nights. We show Pulp Fiction and everyone dresses up like, you know, John Travolta, or we do happy hour cinema, game night, holiday celebrations, you name it. So that is Rooftop Cinema Club. I am going to uh, go to uh, the first and only trivia question that I have, and you will get two pair of tickets included with concessions as well as a drink ticket for those who are 21 and over to our rooftop location at Lincoln Road. So I'm just going now, to- Now, Sherry, before, before you give, give the question, let them know what the value is of the ticket. How much are the ticket costs? Yes, the concession great costs question. 
Yes. So tickets are determined by your seat type. So you can have a single lounge seat if you're like me and like to go to the movies by yourself. Or we have a lounge at a Randex seat or we have the love seats if you want to go as a couple. So this is for two tickets. Our value ranges anywhere from $19 to $25. Our concessions range anywhere from five to seven. And our cocktails start anywhere from 10 to 14. So we are going to include two tickets. However, whatever seat type you want, uh, you let me know. It's going to include concessions as well as a alcoholic beverage. Cool. Okay. All right. Everyone ready? You yeah. guys ready for the question? All right. So I had to do a Top Gun question because our CEO and owner, Jerry, he would not have it any other way. So I am going to shoot to this Top Gun question. And that question is, what was the name of Maverick's sidekick? Not the actor name, but the character name. All right. Yay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I the first Goose. person. So Maggie looks like it's Maggie Dominguez. Yay! Congratulations, Maggie. Maggie. Goose, it is. Goose. <laughs> cool. So Maggie, you'll connect with uh, Shari, and then she will get you the tickets as well as as well as the fun treats. Thank you for everyone for participating. And if you have any other questions for Shari, please let us know. Real quick, Shari. So they they wear the headphones. Yes. I assume they have. Is there any type of sterilization on the headphones? Of course. So we were doing that before the pandemic. So round of applause for our rooftop cinema club. So Great. we sterilize all of our headsets after every use. Um, it takes us about a full hour to flip the venue. So not only do we sanitize the seats as well as the headsets, uh, clean up the space so that you got any everyone that's transitioning in can have that clean and fresh experience. Excellent. And in the event of inclement weather, what is the game plan? You know that it rains in Miami for about five minutes and then all of a sudden yes. everything changes. So what would what would be a typical day if it rained for five or seven minutes? What would be the protocol? So we don't want, you know, bottoms and wet seats. So if we cannot fully recover so that you don't have a damp experience, then we will cancel that screening and you can transfer your tickets over to a new screening. I also want to mention, we just released a series called Silent Disco. So we thought like, how do we utilize these headsets a little bit more? So now we've created um, Silent Disco and Cinema. Uh, we're doing our third one next week on October 26th, and it is a Shrek theme. So we're showing Shrek and we're playing the uh, soundtrack from all three films and it's going to be with two DJs. So those headsets that you use when watching the film, you can click a button and you can listen to all Shrek or you can click the other button to listen to the other DJ. Uh, last month, we did a full Beyonce Renaissance theme across all of our venues. Miami sold out as well as all four other locations in the U.S., and the event was retweeted by Queen Bee herself. So our silent disco series has become quite a buzz. So this week on the 26th, we have the Shrek disco. And next week, uh, next month, we're going to do a whole Barbie versus Ken. So you guys come dressed up. We're going to watch Barbie and you're going to listen to some pop hits as well as some hip hop hits. So look out for those. Ooh, that events. sounds fun. Thank you. Excellent. And then you also do, we spoke uh, backstage, you do the uh, Super Bowls in certain locations. You're going to do the Oscar viewings. The, uh, the Grammy viewing, so on and so forth as well, correct? Yes. So we're going to be showing Super Bowl. We show Super Bowl last year. We're going to be showing the uh, Dolphins, hey, Dolphins, away games on the rooftop. So I'd say just check out RooftopCinemaClub.com for a listing of all of our films as well as our uh, fun events. And then we also, you know, work with the studios. And when they release a new film um, on the streaming platform, you know, you can't see those in traditional theaters. So we uh, work with Amazon Prime, HBO Max, as well as Netflix. And those screenings uh, sometimes are free. So you check out our website uh, when Amazon wants to premiere a film, they will host it uh, free to our guests. So just check out for those events that we call those brand activations. Cool. And then you do the new releases, but usually it's about a three to four week lead before you actually release those new releases some sooner. Exactly. So with our relationships currently with the studios, we can get the films about three to four weeks after they have been released from theater. So we are always going to show the cult classic films, um, but we will start to incorporate new releases as well. Well, cool. now I also went on your website, did a little perusing, and I see that you can actually sign up via cell phone, punch in your cell phone number, and I guess, and also the location. 
because you have multiple locations throughout the U.S. And then I guess you'll be sending them texts as you have updates on different yeah. shows. Texts with updates as well as email updates. So when you uh, purchase a ticket, you'll put your email address in. That's how we communicate with you if we have to cancel the screening. But yeah, definitely get on our email list. And we do not send a bunch of annoying emails. We send emails with free tickets, you know, films that are coming out just so you can be updated on uh, what's going on. And yes, Jody, do we use local vendors? Um, yes. And I'm actually still building up our vendor list. Uh, Miami is uh, one of our newer locations, is not even two years old yet. So I'm I'm still looking for, you know, so many vendors. So yes, if you want to email me, I'll just drop my email in the chat. Um, let's definitely talk. And for, you know, our planners out there on the call, we do, you know, some really nice referral treats. Uh, so definitely, if you have any groups that want to come in or, you know, book the space for private events, uh, definitely let me know. I will be out there Art Basel weekend. So um, I, I will, if all of the dates have not been sold out. If we do a screening, then I'll send you guys some tickets. But I'd love to meet some of you guys um, in person. So I will be out there that weekend. Cool. Thank you, Shari. Anyone else have any questions? Let me just check real quick. We will share all the information, uh, Shari's information in the post-show notes. Uh, Rita's Let's Talk. So Jody's got Rita. Jody's with Rita's Italian Isis. Ooh. Great, great venue you want to partner with. And she's got mobile service as well. I uh, believe that is all. Excellent. Thank you very much, Shari. Very informative and fun. We Thank look you. forward to, to being there very soon. And now the man that everyone waits for, all the information, all the data, the good news. He's, he's in the good news business. Talk to us, Andrew. Tell us what's up. Uh, yes. Well, good morning, everybody. And, and thanks again for having me back, Miguel. Uh, this is, I think, I was counting the 26th time that I've come on here. And, You're almost there. You're 26 uh, out of 41. That's 20, 26. That's right. Record. I've been hanging on for a while. So, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk and and share about the things, the good news, as we say. But, you know, we share news, right? I, I try not to be too much on one side or the other. I try to give you the facts, as everybody here who comes on this call, everyone knows. And, you know, they're subject to interpretation. I wish there was one source of data that I could look at that could just basically do my job for me, right? Where we come in, I tell you A, B, C, but it's never that way, right? There's always a lot of, of uh, things going on and a lot of information to go through as I do every month to try to pull together some, uh, you know, some some type of a story together. And so that's what I do every month. And I will say this last month is a little difficult because part of what I know, what I do and you folks who again attend, which is probably 90% of the people on this call know that, I do look a lot at a lot of economics. I look at a lot of uh, national economics and because I think they're very important and they really give us uh, hopefully a guide as to where it is we're going and how it will come down to travel in our market. But it's complicated, right? And so there's there's so many things going on and I realized that we can go or I could go so far down the rabbit hole that I could spend a lot of time talking about economics and finance and, and never get to you know what's really important here locally. But it is all important and it is all linked. And so... Every month, that's what I try to do is just give you this view from a macro level down to a micro level, and then hopefully information that you can use to guide yourselves um, in your respective uh, industries and businesses to potentially plan and understand a little bit more. And, and if anything else, I promise you that when we get off this call today, you know, the information I give you on tourism will be something that you have and nobody else will have it yet. Right. So every month when we release this stuff, you are the first people oftentimes to see this stuff. So I think that's great. And so that said, let me share my screen and my report to you. And can everybody see this? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Hang on a second here. Let me move some of these icons out of the way. It would seem to block my screen. Okay. All right. Well, here we go, folks. Let's start with, as I just mentioned, some economics. And we all know inflation is here. We all know, essentially, we feel it. We know that inflation continues to be a problem. Uh, inflation has been going down, as we all know, but that doesn't mean the prices are going down, right? So um, we look at inflation. This particular article that I received, I thought, tells a pretty good story about what we're seeing. And they mentioned uh, terms such as headline inflation and core inflation. And so oftentimes when you hear inflation being talked about, it's talked about in a number of different ways. It could be headline, it could be core, it could be something else, it could be CPI, it could be PPI, right? There's all these different terms that go into inflation. But headline inflation talks about inflation from a larger perspective. Um, but when you talk about core inflation, 
those are price increases that excludes food and energy. So depending upon the story that you're hearing, they could be talking about one or the other or both. Um, what makes it different is that food and energy, we see a lot more shocks. We see a lot more increases or decreases, and it therefore will potentially um, inflate one a little bit more in terms of the numbers. Some, some economists seem to feel that you know, looking at headline inflation um, might be different or better, just depending upon, um, or I should say core inflation, actually, because it excludes those things that are more volatile, such as food and energy. So what we do know here is that there's, there's it's slowing, but you know there's still things that are going on here that are going to continue to persist and continue to create inflation. Um, that said, we know that the Fed is continually trying to fight these things, and you know the Fed is essentially, as some people call it, a one-trick pony. Right? There's only so many things that the Fed can do to control this economy, and two of the biggest things that they do are essentially just changing, you know, raising or or um, lowering the uh, interest rate. And as well as printing money. And uh, so we've seen a lot of both of those things. Both of those things can obviously contribute and are contributing to a lot of the things that we're seeing right now. So as we all know that they have been raising the rates quite a bit. And their plan here, as it's saying here, is that they're going to continue to keep their monetary policy restrictive. Because that mean does that mean more increases in rates? It's quite possible. You know, I don't really know what that is yet. But as we continue to see here that inflation is still still an issue. Headline inflation is outpacing core inflation, still growing. Um, however, core inflation also edged higher as well. So there, as this article says, so much for slaying the inflation problem. So all they're really saying here is that the Fed can only do so much to uh, tame this problem, but inflation will still persist. Um, what we see here, too, is uh, when we talk about the prices of things like food and energy, um, they matter an awful lot, and particularly when you are more price sensitive, households that are in lower income brackets. Um, it will certainly affect them more than others. But energy costs are something that affects everybody. And that, that means that it's like a shock, a ripple effect, and that these different costs of energy hike up the prices of goods and services. And therefore, those prices have to be passed on to the consumer. Also, th something here, which I pulled out from this article specifically, was that these travel costs. And consumers are, are facing increasingly higher travel costs. Uh, revenge travel, they mentioned revenge travel. They say, hey, it starts, it's, Phenomena that may be starting to abate, at least that's how I read this article. Uh, they talked about a cost of hotel stay increased by almost 4% in September, still higher than a year ago. So that's not necessarily the case in Miami, as a lot of you hoteliers know, our rates are not holding up. But in terms of the overall cost in our country here, there's a lot of places that are just becoming extremely expensive. They're, they're now charging higher rates than they ever did before. And so we see that reflecting. And some of that actually is just higher insurance and labor costs, as we know. Um, there's a, certainly um, with inflation comes this increase in wages because of the need to increase wages to keep up. And so that will certainly um, impact your labor costs. Let me just stop one moment here, too, before I go forward, because I look for an article to explain in more detail. And there's just too much out there. But it was pointed out to me. I was listening last week to a podcast and they actually pointed out something that I felt was really probably the most important to watch. And we talk about spending. I talk about spending every month because spending, when the spending stops, then we're worried, right? When people start putting, stop putting a dollar to come in your hotel, you know, or coming in and, uh, you know, that dollar, I like to say, is uh, spread, right? That person pays for a room, that money goes to your staff, it goes to your food, it goes to your mortgage, so on and so forth. And that's how everything goes around. Um, so a lot of times we look at spending, you know, we're in a, you know, it's capitalism, right? So we look at spend as being what, um, essentially keeps everything going, the, the flow of dollars, but that's actually not quite the case. And what it really is, it's not really a spend economy. What we have is a credit economy. And I think that's really important. And if you're an economics person, I'm sure you could run circles around me in these conversations. But when I heard it, I thought, yes, you know, that is really what, what this is all about. It's credit, right? And so when we want to understand what's going on right now in our economy, look at credit because that availability of credit uh, how much people are borrowing, how much less, how much it costs, how much it costs for businesses. What are those things that affect credit is going to affect everything else. So it's essentially credit that underpins the spend. So just wanted to bring that up. I did not find an article to adequately ex express that, but maybe you got a little bit of that. So looking here at the rising cost of fun could be a drag. And this was from a Wall Street Journal. I thought this was interesting because they talk about ticket prices and some of you have a uh, venues, as we've been talking about here. And you may already know that the costs are rising um, a lot, actually. And 
there's this phenomena, this this term was the first time I heard called funflation, right? Funflation, meaning that the cost of some of these things are going up much higher than the cost of any other thing. So people may be starting to feel some tapped out. There was a recent study done with the Wall Street Journal through and Credit Karma, and they say 60% of Americans say they've had to cut back on spending on live entertainment because of rising costs. Uh, furthermore, another 37% of respondents said they can't keep up with the rising uh, price of events they want to attend. That said, you know, more than 20% of Americans say they're willing to take on debt to continue to be able to afford their, their favorite entertainment activities. So, so while survey did doesn't tell the whole story, what it doesn't tell you is what they're going to do, right? It tells you what they say they're, they're, go they're going to do, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what they're going to do, um, unfortunately. But it does give you an idea of, uh, you know, of, of that range and what people say that they feel. So as I've mentioned here, the cost of admissions and fees actually are rising faster and the prices of food, gasoline, and other things from 2022. So that said, um, we're still spending a lot more on entertainment. And and this year, as it says in the last line, Americans are on track to spend about $95 billion um, on tickets to, to spectator amusements. But that's higher, right? That's 23% from last year. So all these folks are saying a lot of people are cutting back. Not everybody's cutting back. And they're spending, they're paying the money. So nonetheless, we are up 23% from last year. So, so. You know, the story here, I think, is that people are becoming increasingly cautious. People are still going out. But for a lot of people, they are saying that they are now cutting back. And when I talk to some of you folks, I run into a lot of you folks out there in, in Miami, all over the place. And I'm hearing a lot of the same feedback. So that's one of the reasons why I included this is because a lot of people are telling me uh, they are seeing similar types of behavior in their respective venues. Looking at inflation, this is an easy way to just explain inflation and a little bit of how it works. Um, this comes from Open Table. As you folks know, I like to use Open Table a lot because it really talks a lot about what's going on. And it's very simple. It's the data is always updated and it's readily available on their website. But this graph that they put out there is just shows um, the US um, inflation index year over year and then comparing to the average monthly check size per diner in open table rest restaurants. So what you see from the left to the right there is that red line is inflation, which paces above the average check amount. Um, however, what that really tells me is, again, people are just not keeping up. You know, they're not able to continue to spend at the same rate as the prices are going up. And that's why you see these two that are separate. But as you move on and on and on, the inflation, the rate of inflation, I should say, has been going down. And then you start to see a, a commensurate um, raise in terms of the average check amount, which tells me that people are starting to spend more and more because they are now being able to spend. That would imply that for one thing, wages, which always lag inflation, they still have to come up. And so, you know, wages start to come up. And so people have a little bit more breathing room. They're starting to make a little bit more money and therefore they're able to, to spend a little bit more money. But we see towards the end there that we're still, while the gap has closed, um, the inflation, the rate of inflation is still higher. And uh, I'll answer questions at the very end. I see a few questions up there, thank you. So again, using open table data, again, this may not be representative of all the restaurants out there. Let me qualify that, but it is a good proxy to look at. So looking at the U.S. volume of diners by month, at that top chart by, uh, by month for the U.S., we see that was really high in January year over year, but that has decreased quite a bit. And we see that for, um, for the rest of the year, we're just not quite keeping up to uh, last year. And even down there at the bottom, we see that by day, um, starting in October here, we're still not quite at the watermark that we're at last year. So that seems to say that the volume of people coming into these restaurants is not what it was a year ago. And then drilling down a little bit more, uh, looking at some of these top markets, looking at by market here, and I've taken our markets, the city of Miami Beach and the city of Miami and yellow to give you an illustration of how we're doing. But, you know, we're not keeping up with last year. But then again, the, I don't know if I'm gonna call it good news, but a lot of the markets are in, in the same boat as we are. So it's, it's, it seems to be a national trend, some are worse than others. Obviously, we know Florida has been, you know, we were doing really, really, really well, better than others. And now here we are comparing to one of our best years. So we're just not going to keep up in a lot of ways. And that seems to be the case. But a lot of other markets uh, like Las Vegas, New York, Atlanta, and even down at the bottom, San Francisco, they're certainly not keeping up to last year either. Switching over to global visa wait times, I've been talking about these quite a bit. And some interesting developments here, not all great, to be honest with you. I compared the visa wait times from the last time I shared with you folks in the beginning of September to what they were just this weekend. And in some cases, they're getting better. In some cases, they're getting worse. Now, in the last several months, we saw a lot of improvement with markets um, with Brazil, 
that was the big story. However, and looking at some of the numbers for Brazil, in some cases, they're actually going the opposite way again. For example, Rio de Janeiro uh, went from 127 days, which a couple of months prior was like over a year. And now we see that they're actually going back up again. So the only thing I can add to that that I know is that the, there's an increase in demand. So, you know, it doesn't seem that they're able to keep up with that quite a bit. However, places like Sao Paulo are actually going the other way. So so I don't know the complete story there, but I thought I would share that with you to show that there is definitely some volatility. Mexico continues to to slide and to not get any better. Uh, one thing I did notice there, Buenos Aires, Argentina, very challenged. I have a little bit more information to share in Argentina um, that I have not shared before. But um, in this case, you can see that they're also challenged at getting a visa and that is going in the opposite direction, unfortunately. Looking at our airport, Miami International Airport, looking at the top table there from January to August for arrivals, international, domestic and total. We see that international arrivals are pacing above last year uh, and the split is about 45 percent international, 55 percent domestic. So international continues to increase, but the domestic share, the domestic, I should say, volume um, has decreased um, from a record year. Overall, though, we're still up about 3%, which is a great thing. And then down there at the bottom, those bar charts just represent the split. And I'm looking at the split to say, hey, where are we getting to? In terms of international domestic in the past, um, pre-pandemic, we were 50-50. We're almost always 50-50. And in this case, this just shows us that international still recovers, but is still not still not quite where it was um, in the past. I shared this a few months ago, but I'm gonna share it again, because again, we're talking about some of these international markets as well as our overall visitor numbers. On the left here for the first six months of this year, Colombia was down, but Canada, Brazil, UK, many other markets have increased quite a bit. Argentina, as I just mentioned, um, is down. So their visa wait times are down. Um, some of that is showing up in terms of overall visitors. We see the same thing. Uh, however, if you look to the right there, that Table domestic international Florida resident, that's our overall total for the first six months of this year, comparing to last year in 2019. And what we see is that we've had a huge volume of domestic, which has since receded, but this international volume has increased. And also Florida resident. And, and there's a story to be said in the Florida resident right now that we're seeing quite a bit more strength than we have in the past from the Florida resident. So overall, for the first six months of this year, we're up a total of 1% in uh, visitation year over year. Uh, that will uh, should be interesting because I'm working on the numbers right now for Q3. I won't have them. Um, hopefully, I'll have something for share to share next month, but um, as of yet, I don't. We look at mobile data a lot. Again, doesn't tell the whole story, but it's quite revealing. We look at the mobile data, and these are, of course, your devices. When you come into our market, um, we know where you go. <laughs> so looking at the top here, September 2022 and September 2023 in the bottom, that roll up from January, September 22 and 23. There's a lot of information here. I'll walk you through some of it. And of course, we'll have this deck that you can uh, that you can review yourself. But what this is telling me, looking at September um, 22 and September 23, is that we are seeing a flip to more drive than we had last year. That seems to be the case. Our overnight visitors on the left there, 85% of these people reflected, and this is domestic data. I have to quickly qualify that. Um, international data, we don't really have for for mobile data for different privacy laws, but the domestic there's plenty of. So what we see here is that overnight visitors last year as a percentage of total decreased. And of course that speaks into the number of days in market, which pretty much cut in half from 3.9 days to two days. And what we also see is that, as I've mentioned here, the domestic market has receded, but what has taken its place in, in some cases quite a bit is the share of Florida markets and looking at things like West Palm Beach and Orlando that have both seen really good increases in terms of share year over year. And the same thing reflects down at the bottom from January, to September. Uh, looking at the same thing, we are seeing that the overnight visitors have gone down. Um, that range of, of where they come from has increased. So again, I'll share this with you when I'm, I'm after this, but there's a lot of information here that just tells you that, that what we are seeing now, um, while the air traffic is really still strong, it's more of a drive market than we've had before. And this just sort of breaks it down again here. I won't go through all of it, but looking at that distance share trend, we see there, um, looking at the left here, I think this is interesting, looking at this charted out from January 22 all the way to present day, we see that that share of uh, short distance versus long haul, that light blue is really just considered short distance. Most of that would be considered drive. Um, we're not looking at anything under 50 miles, essentially, because that turns out to be really local and we don't really count that in terms of visitation. But you can see that 
starting on the left here, 28% of those people that were here in January 22 were really more of a drive market. They were short distance. And then that 64% represents people more than 500 miles. And you can see how that split just really changed, even to a point now where in the last couple of months, we see slightly more day visitors and slightly more people coming from, from uh, shorter distances than uh, before. So even when we're cutting out Florida, we can see some similar types of trends where the length of stay, bottom left, is not holding up to what it was last year, and that overnight trend is not holding up either. I have never shared this information with you before, but here you go, you're welcome. <laughs> visa card spend. So we do have some data on visa card spend. It's not complete, and I'll say that first before I go into this, because uh, for one thing, the visa card spend does not include uh, expenditures through OTAs. And it also doesn't include things like Uber, because if it's not actually charged in our market, then it won't show up in the visa data. That said, visa data shows an awful lot. And so on the left here, we have our domestic markets. And I'm showing here that, again, New York is not surprised that they are the highest spending, the highest spenders, but their spend is down. Uh, many of the other, most of the other domestic markets are down, except, as I just mentioned, the Florida resident. And those are are uh, highlighted there in yellow. And if you look at those different yellow markets there, you'll see that they're actually really popped up a lot in the last year. We see them in our visitor numbers, and then we see, of course, as well as their spend. In some cases like Fort Myers, while they don't have as big of a volume of visa spend, they're actually spending an awful lot more here with their visa than they were a year ago. On the right, I picked out select countries. Understand that, you know, in terms of ranking, they may not all be the same for the visitation because not every market has the same rate of visa penetration. You know, as an example, I don't have it up here, but China has about 16% of the total expenditures in Chinese in China by Chinese are done with a visa. So most of their stuff in their country is not visa. So the visa car penetration is not the same. Every country has a different visa um, penetration rate. That said, it's still a great way to look at trend. And we can see that Canada is really getting the lion's share and really getting um, gets the most, but we see solid increases. However, as I've mentioned here, where are we struggling? Argentina down 29% in terms of the visa card spend, Colombia down 29, 24%. But otherwise, we look at the other markets and there's a good story there in some cases, and in many cases, double digit growth in terms of their visa spend in our market. Quickly looking at a hotel, I see here that in sharing, uh, we just got our hotel data last week through September. So what we're really seeing here is that occupancy has not been holding up this year, but really it's, it's not as bad as it looks because what we're doing is comparing to last year, um, we have been looking, one of the reasons why we're not seeing occupancy as high is because we continually add hotel inventory. And this year we've been running around one and a half to two and a half percent increase overall supply year over year. So that just simply reflects in occupancy. Year to date, we're down about 2%, uh, down further ADR. What we see here is that, yeah, we our rates have continued to slide. However, they're not getting as bad, if that makes any sense. Um, as of September, it was down about 4% year over year. Um, for the year, about 6%. And then rev par, which is just your um, average daily rate multiplied by occupancy, give you the rev par. So maybe not as hot as last year, but that's where we're trending. So it seems to be moving up a little bit, not as big of a decrease year over year. And that demand, as I mentioned, demand, which is really what drives this, this is at the heart of it. Looking at the last 26 weeks, what we see here is that the demand has been up and down year over year. But generally speaking, it hasn't deviated that much. You know, certainly not 10%. It's much less than 10%. Oftentimes, it's really just a fraction. It's just a 1%, 2% different variance a year over year. But overall, the story here is that it's essentially, when you look at the, the longer term, it's pretty much on par with where it was a year ago. And looking at regional hotel performance here, I'm not going to read every every market here. But again, um, for the most weekend, for the most, can't talk this morning. Uh, for the most recent week available, October 14th, we see that we were down a little bit in occupancy on a county level and certain markets like Miami Beach sort of drove some of those declines in occupancy and ADR. But some other areas were actually doing pretty well. For example, Aventura Sunny Isles, our occupancy actually was a little better year over year. So it was Coconut Grove and Key Biscayne. And even South Miami saw quite a bit of a bump. And actually ADR also followed that suit for some of these markets that was actually a little bit higher year over year. And then finally here, we see if I take Miami-Dade County at the top and compare it to that bottom line, which is just Florida as a whole, we can see that that while Florida as a whole was also down, but we were less down. So compared to the whole, we were performing outperforming the state. And then the forecast. I want to share this forecast because I've shared it with you before. What I did not do was update with actual performance. 
I've just shared with you the forecast. And I think there's a story here as well. And so what I've done here for August and September, what you're going to see here is that F is the forecast, A is the actual. And for the month of August, we actually did not do quite as well as what was forecasted for us. Uh, we see that we were down a little bit across the board. However, September here is what I think was really, which is one of the reasons why I really want to share this, is that we were actually stronger in September than we were predicted to be. And when uh, STR, which gets their forecast from Torres and Economics, sent me this, this uh, forecast back in August, I sent it back because they were telling me that we were going to be down 10% in overall um, room demand for September. And I thought that was impossible. Uh, and you'll see, and you, you know this, but you know, we've been seeing a different trend in the data. Uh, I sent it back. They sent it back and said, yeah, we, we think you're probably right. But they still predict that we would be down almost 5% in terms of demand. And we were not. We were down just almost 1%. So it was uh, much better than anticipated. So we saw as a result of that, a slight bump in occupancy as compared to what they thought it was going to be. Um, room rate, not surprised. But Overall, it was a better picture in September than we had pictured than we thought it would be. Moving forward, it's going to be a little volatile. Um, November and December, they're saying that we're going to see some better demand. And that would result in uh, overall better occupancy and even potentially a slight bump in ADR in December. What they're saying, and I'm not going to agree with them, is that they're saying that for the first quarter of this coming year, that we're going to be down in terms of demand and, uh, and occupancy. And I'll show you why in a moment why I don't agree with that. But that's what it presently is saying. Looking at this 90-day outlook, which I share every month, um, I think it's really in, in, it's really informative. The top being hotel reserved occupancy. What we're seeing is relatively on par with last year. And looking a little bit towards the middle there for hotel, our Basel shifted a week, which is why you see it look funny the way it is. But what it's really saying is that the bookings for our Basel on a county level, based on the data we have, are holding up. And similarly, at the bottom there with short-term rentals, we are looking at a similar situation, but also really strong activity, even coming up close, but further out, there seems to be a lot more booking. This is why, this chart is why I'm saying I don't agree with the forecast that, that I just showed you. And what we're seeing here, and this is the reserved occupancy um, by month for the next year. And we see here on that table to the right, I just simply say, hey, here's what it was this year, this is what it was last year, and plus or minus the, percent, the percentage points. And yeah, October, November, um, they're saying we're, right now it's down a little bit. But look at December, January, February, March, April, May. Right now, so far, our overall reserve occupancy on a county level with this group of hotels uh, appears to be much better than what they're forecasting. So I hope this is the story and not the one that, that was painted for us. A new forecast will be out next month. And if I have it available, I'll share with you folks. And then finally, our summary is I'm just going to, again, economic conditions are still uncertain. Inflation is still not under control. Um, it's not increasing as much as it did. Uh, this might be providing some people a little bit more spending room. And I hope so as their wages slowly rise. Uh, we mentioned funflation. There you go. There's your fun fact for today. Funflation. Uh, it's making things like events more expensive. Um, however, people, people are still spending that in a lot of ways, but they are becoming increasingly hesitant based on what we see to fork out those dollars, they don't have them. Um, once again, international visitation, it's improving. Um, visa wait times are hurting us potentially in some ways, certainly with markets like Argentina, um, they are not always moving in the right direction, but Florida residents are filling in a lot of the gaps. Uh, overall though, as I just mentioned to you, it looks like the picture's not bad right now and moving ahead, particularly in Q1 of next year, we anticipate that hotel performance is gonna look, gonna look fair, everything else staying equal. That is it, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we did have a few questions. Uh, did you catch those? I know one was if you're sharing the information, which I already responded to. No, I didn't. I couldn't follow it all. Okay. So I uh, don't there are there any questions that were put in the chat that we're not seeing? Please uh, re repost. Hold on. We, got, we have one. Uh, just thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Charlotte from Vizcaya says that she's seeing a strong visitation from Florida residents, as you alluded to in your in your presentation. Um, one question. Do we have any data on how many people visit Miami per month? Is that something I, that could be measured? Yeah, I actually do. We have a, a visitor, a working model that that does. It lies by a few months. I'm always happy to share. Um, I will try to share more of that next month. Okay, perfect. And... One, one article I did read that instead of revenge travel, people are leaning towards value travel, where they're looking what they're receiving for what they're paying for. 
uh, whether it be amenities or service or lack thereof on bo- in both cases, I think that's that's a very big uh, telltale sign of, of what the expectation is now. See if there's anyone else. Uh, what is the current room inventory in the greater in Greater Miami and Miami Beach? This is from Elbow Machado. Um, it's in the deck, but it's around sixty six thousand five hundred rooms. Okay, your average daily inventory. Great. And, and I do want to say one thing before we go into the gas card. Um, we have our annual meeting coming up on Thursday. If you're not going, um, I invite you to go. Please do. It's a great time. It's as everybody here who has been knows, we put on a nice little party. But this year, if you're not going to be there or you don't know, let me know. I'm happy to get you in if you've forgotten or if you're not a partner and didn't hear about it. Just simply contact me and we'll get you on that list so you can come and see us on, on Thursday. Great. Do you share any of this information on the uh, at the annual meeting or is this is more uh, overall perspective? They, they just share program. like very high end, like very high level stuff. You know, we're okay. much more detail with this. So, OK, cool. Well, thank you very much. You guys are getting for we, we're all getting first first hand knowledge of of everything that goes on before it goes out publicly. Thank you very much, Andrew. So you have your trivia question. I do. Um, if you're paying attention, uh, I mentioned Visa card spend. Uh, what would be, and you saw the ranking of uh, domestic markets in terms of how much they've been spending on their visa, but what was the number one spending Florida market? Number one spending Florida market, not New York, Orlando, Naples. I think it was Orlando, no? It was Orlando, correct. It was Orlando. So Jacob, let me just make sure, it was Kiev, Kiev, Naples. Well, no, hold on. Naid, oh, you guys answered quick. Gary, Gary's the winner. So Gary... Congratulations. You get a $50 gas card. Compliments of Andrew. Awesome. Thank you very much. Anyone have any other questions? Sure. Okay. Let me uh, wrap this up real quick. Our next call is Monday, November 20th. On that call, we will have is, is Isabel from the Lincoln Road from Lincoln Road. Also, John Copeland will be giving us an update on Basil and all things art. Show notes will be sent later on today. <clears throat> We are having a pre-Halloween party at the Silby Food Hall, which was formerly the Time Out Market on Monday, uh, 1030, uh, Monday, the 30th of uh, October. I will send more information on that on the show notes. Again, thank you, Andrew, Annie, and Sherry. Congrats to our winners, Daniel, Maggie, and Gary. In closing, in our lines of work, regardless of the discipline, whether it's a concierge, front desk, sales executive, we all have privileges to celebrate the most joyful moment with our guests and even bring a ray of light in the most difficult moment. Most importantly, though, we have an opportunity, a responsibility to create magic in a world that desperately needs it. As you can see in all the news reports, we definitely need some magic in our world. Have a happy and safe Halloween. Do something with intent in posit- that, that gives a positive impact the life of someone else. Until next month, take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Our goal is to inspire travel. We want to expose you to what Miami and South Florida has to offer. From Key Biscayne to Coconut Grove, South Beach to Calle Ocho and everywhere in between, Miami is a vibrant city and offers a wide array of popular attractions and venues. Come join us.